Welcome to the Sunday message from Welcome to the Sunday message from Hollyview Church in Boring, Oregon. We gather each Sunday morning at 10:30 as a worshiping community of Jesus followers on mission to see God glorified in our lives, our cities, and around the world. At Hollyview, the Bible serves as our foundation and guide for both life and ministry. It tells the story of God and the story of us. We believe the better we know the themes and flow of the biblical story, the better we will be able to find our little place in God's grand storyline. Thank you for joining us. And now, here's this week's message from Hollyview Church as Pastor Joel preaches from 2 Samuel chapter 19 and 20 with the message entitled, Return of the King. appreciative for Stephen. He would troubleshoot, he just troubleshot the, my mic. So thanks for serving back there. And you only get noticed when something goes wrong, right? <laughs> uh, I'd like to begin today by reading from 2 Samuel 19. We're in a series. We're getting right toward the end of 2 Samuel uh, and our series in the book of Samuel through this year. Um, you can find it in your pew books on uh, 2 Samuel 19, starting in verse 8 on page 253. If you have a pew Bible or you don't have a Bible, take that Bible. That's a gift to you. Uh, page 253, 2 Samuel 19. I'd like to ask you if you would stand once more, if you're able, as uh, I read God's word. 2 Samuel 19, 8. Now Israel had fled every man to his own home. And all the people were arguing throughout all the tribes of Israel, saying, The king delivered us from the hand of our enemies and saved us from the hand of the Philistines. And now... He has fled out of the land from Absalom. But Absalom, who we appointed over us, is dead in battle. Now, therefore, why do you say nothing about bringing the king back? Verse 11. And the king and King David sent this message to Zadok and Abiathar, the priest. Say to the elders of Judah, why should you be the last to bring the king back to his house? When the word of all Israel has come to the king. You are my brothers, you are my bone and my flesh. Why then should you be the last to bring back the king? And say to Amasa, are you not bone and my flesh? God do so to me, and more also, if you are not commander of my army from now on the place of Joab. And he swayed the heart of all the men of Judah as one man, so that they sent word to the king, return, both of you and all your servants. Verse 15. So the king came back to the Jordan, and Judah came to Gilgal to meet the king and to bring the king over the Jordan. May God bless the reading of his word. You may have a, have a seat. Uh, if you haven't been with us, David has uh, run away in exile when his son tries to assume uh, the throne of the king. He has uh, been far away, and now we get word. We finally come to the point where the king is returning back uh, into the land. Uh, let's stop for a moment and just pray. Lord, as we uh, come to your word, and there's so much going on, I'll just admit, Lord, there's so much going on in my mind this morning and, and my heart of the rest of the day and the activities, even this month that seems so packed. Would you just give us uh, peace for the next half hour? Would you call each of us to yourself? Lord, would you give us uh, open eyes to see what you have for us? Open our ears so that we could hear what you would want us to hear. Lord, soften our hearts so that when the message that the king is returning comes to us, that we would uh, go out to meet him and we would be met with grace. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, King David uh, has left and now is on his way back. He comes to the Jordan River, uh, but there's a lot of water under the bridge from this moment. Uh, there's been a civil war uh, in Israel and Judah, and so that means brothers have killed brothers, cousins have killed cousins. Uh, pe people have actually done a lot of harm to each other. Uh, as David is going out of Jerusalem, he actually encounters people throwing rocks at him and cursing at him as he leaves. Uh, so, so there's a lot of bad blood going on. And so the question as David comes back to uh, the throne, back to Jerusalem, is who, who should he welcome into the kingdom? Uh, who, who should he allow into the kingdom? The, uh, the guy who's his enemy, the, the people that just have stuff to give him and a gift to give him, who, who does he welcome back into 
the kingdom. Well, before we get to the text, I actually want to uh, illustrate this tension with a story from church history. Um, since the beginning of the church, I don't know how many, I, I mean, I could guess probably, but I don't know how many church splits there have been. But my guess is there's been probably hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of church splits. Uh, I lived through a church split 20 years ago, and it was, it was pretty silly. Uh, and most church splits are. They, or they start arguing over, like, color of carpet or uh, music or something like that. But then others are very significant as well. And so this morning I want to tell you about the very first significant church split in church, in church history. Um, and it all centered really around a, a question, and, and it was a difficult question. Uh, you see, in the early 300s, there was an emperor in Rome called Diocletian. Uh, Diocletian was not a believer. He did not like Jesus or the church at all. And so he uh, tortured and sent people to just destroy the, the church. He actually made this edict. Let me, let me read it for you. A uh, historian wrote it down. He said, it was the 19th year of Diocletian's reign, so AD 303, and the month Dystrus, which is March by the Romans, and the festival of the Savior's Passion, so Easter was approaching, when an imperial decree was published everywhere, ordering that churches be razed to the ground, actually not razed, but actually destroyed to the ground, and the scriptures destroyed by fire, and giving notice that those in places of honor should lose their places and domestic staff if they continue to profess Christianity. They would be deprived of their liberty, such was the first decree against us. Soon afterwards, other decrees arrived in rapid succession, ordering that the presidents, that's what they call the pastors or the leaders of the church, the presidents of the churches in every place should, be, uh, should all be the first committed to prison and then co coerced by every possible means into offering sacrifices to other, other gods. You see, Diocletian's decree was meant it was open season uh, for Christians. Destroy them. You see them gathered like this. You may go in and do anything you want. And anyone uh, that had an honored position, they should be the first ones to be thrown in prison or tortured or, or beaten. So that's a difficult uh, question. Do you, do you run or do you stay? If you knew that staying meant that you were going to be landing in jail or that your, your family could actually be uh, tortured or killed or put in prison as well, would you stay still or would you, would you run? It's not an easy question to, to answer, and so the people in the church during that time, uh, they answered it differently. Uh, some of them uh, ran and hid so that they could come back to shepherd their flock later on. Uh, others, uh, just the mere threat of it, uh, didn't do anything, and they stayed and actually were thrown in jail and tortured and, and actually had limbs uh, cut off. Uh, they marked on their bodies this, this torture. It was a difficult decision, and there was different uh, answers to, to it. Do we stay or, or do we go? Well, uh, there was another emperor after that who was kind of weak, and then the emperor after that was, was Constantine. And Constantine uh, allowed for Christianity. Uh, and not only that, he said, boy, we're really, it's really fragmented. It would be easier to govern if they were all unified. So he called for the Council of Nicaea. Uh, 325, he gets all these church leaders together, uh, 318 bishops and pastors and priests and leaders all together to, to work out some of these questions, like questions in theology. And the biggest question they had and they wrestled with was, what do we do with the people who, who went away from the church during this time? Uh, there were people sitting there who were missing uh, an arm or a leg or a finger or a tongue sitting right next to people who had run away during that time and came back safe with all of their facilities. They said, what, what should we do with those people that ran away and then came back? And even more, what do we do with those people that, that ran away and there wasn't even really a threat? Do we let them back in? Uh, do we keep them out? Do we know that they're not the true, uh, true believers of Jesus? What do we do? Are we supposed to let them in or let them out? I've actually thought about this a lot in the last two years. Uh, as COVID has come in and has caused uh, the response from the church to be very different things. How do we respond? So if someone hasn't come to church in two years because of COVID and they come back, how should we respond as a church? Well, the Council of Nicaea, they uh, argued this and came up with the canon. It's no, canon number 11. Uh, this was actually disagreed upon, though, and this is where the church uh, started splitting from there. How, how do you uh, respond to these people? Here, here's what the council said, though. 
Canon number 11 of Nicaea. Concerning those who have transgressed without necessity or the confiscation of their property or without danger or anything of this nature, as happened under the tyranny of Licinius. That's, that was the next emperor, and although he threatened it, he never really came through on a lot of it, and still people ran. This holy synod, the people that have both stayed and been tortured and ran away and come back, this holy synod decrees that though they do not deserve leniency, nevertheless, they should be treated mercifully. They don't deserve it, but let's give them grace. Let's give them mercy. I really believe that the church at that time accurately reflected what the kingdom of God was like. The kingdom of God, where it doesn't matter what you've done or your history, when you come to the kingdom, you come to the gates of the, the kingdom, you are welcomed with grace and truth. And in the same way that the, the council uh, agreed the, to represent and respond the kingdom of God with grace, we're going to see today in our text that David accurately reflects the kingdom of God too. As, as he is on his way back into the kingdom and three different people are going to meet him and he's going to respond to each person who's quite differently with grace. The kingdom of God is marked with grace upon grace to those who come. And you might, you might think, well, that was them, but I got a really mean uh, family member. Or, or my neighbor, boy, he is so antagonistic. Like, I don't know, how, how am I supposed to respond uh, to him? Well, we're going to see in our text today an example of, of how we should respond to, like that, respond to those people. Uh, David is called back. Uh, Absalom is killed in battle, so David's like, okay, I'm going to go back to the palace back to the throne, but he stops at the Jordan River. And there at the Jordan River, before his triumphal entry back into Jerusalem as the king, he's going to meet three people in our text today, and all of them with very unique histories and characteristics. Um, if For those Bible nerds who are like, oh, I really want to dig into it, uh, on the way out, David meets three people in 2 Samuel 16, and on the way back in, he actually meets three people, uh, and those same three people. Uh, and you see, like, the backstory of all these people. We don't have time to go into. I'll summarize them. Uh, but it's actually very narratively, it's just beautiful how uh, going out, he meets these people who pretty much don't do anything with him and curse him on the way out. And then when they come back, those th same three people come and meet him. So we're going to meet uh, three people, and each person is going to be met by grace of the king. So let's meet our first person. Are you ready? With me? First person, the repenting enemy is met with grace. The repenting enemy is met with grace. Enter Shimei. Shimei, uh, if you remember from 2 Samuel 16, was the one when David was leaving, was throwing rocks at David, cussing at him, and throwing dust everywhere. And all the people are like, David, aren't you going to kill this guy? And David's like, just let it go. Just let it go. This is Shimei. The last time David had seen Shimei, he was hurling rocks at his face, trying to kill him or hurt him. That's Shimei. Now let's read about this encounter, starting in verse 16. 2 Samuel 19, 16. And Shimei, the son of Gera, the Benjamite from Barhuim, hurried to come down with the men of Judah to meet King David. And with him were a thousand men from Benjamin, and Ziba, the servant of the house of Saul, with his 15 sons and 20 servants, rushed down to the Jordan before the king. And they crossed the ford to bring over the king's household and to do his pleasure. And Shimei, the son of Gera, fell down before the king as he was about to cross the Jordan. And he said to the king, Let not my lord hold me guilty, or remember how your servant did uh, wrong on the day my lord the king left Jerusalem. Did not, uh, do, not let the king take it, uh, do not let the king take it to heart, for your servant knows that I have sinned. Therefore, behold, I have come this day, the first of all the house of Joseph, to come down to meet my lord the king. Verse 21. Abishai, that's Joab's brother, uh, it's the commander's brother, uh, the son of Zeruiah, answered, Shall not Shemei be put to death for this, because he cursed the Lord's anointed? It's a natural response. But David, he, he said, what have I to do with you, you sons of Zuriah, that you should 
this day be as an adversary to me? Shall anyone be put to death in Israel this day? For do I not know that I am this day king over Israel? And the king had said to Shimei, you shall not die. And the king gave him his oath. The very first person that David meets on his triumphal entry back in Jerusalem is this weasel of a guy who was throwing rocks at him, cussing at him, throwing dirt on him. Uh, he wanted nothing to do with David. He showed his true colors, and everyone saw it. He humiliated him, disgraced him, and he comes back and goes, Oh, David, yeah, sorry about that. Will, will you forgive me? I, I, I kind of messed up. And, and sh this, guy, uh, this guy, Abishai, he's like, are you kidding me? Kill the sucker. This guy doesn't deserve to live. He doesn't deserve to be entered into your kingdom. He showed exactly who he was. And David says, time out. Don't you know that I'm the king? Don't you know that the king coming into Jerusalem is not about death and destruction, but about bringing life? And he actually looks down at Shimei and says, you're not going to die. Come into my kingdom. It's not about death. It's about bringing life. What a picture of grace. This guy does not deserve it. He does not deserve to enter the kingdom. He has done some horrible things. He was an enemy of the path of the Lord in the past. He's cussing. He's throwing things. He does not deserve it, and yet he's met with grace upon grace. As David says, come on in. Uh, it's a picture of grace for you as well this morning. Uh, I don't know your history. Uh, I don't know where you've been. Um, I don't know the the evils that you have done in your past, but as you turn and come to the gates of the kingdom, you come to the, the, the great king, Jesus, uh, you're going to be met with grace upon grace. That's the first person. The, the repenting enemy is met with grace. Let's move on to our next person. Meet the next person. The second one. The helpless and the scoundrel are met with grace. The helpless and the scoundrel are met with grace. So enter Mephibosheth and his servant, Ziba. Now, Mephibosheth, you might remember, if you've been tracking with us in the story, Mephibosheth uh, was lame when he was five years old. The guy can't walk. He's, he's, he's helpless. So on the day that David leaves the, uh, the palace and he's on his way out, uh, Mephibosheth is left there. He can't move on his own. Uh, he can't walk. He can't go, oh, yeah, I'm going to follow that and just go after him. He, he's totally uh, vulnerable. And the only person there that could help him was actually a guy named Ziba who was his servant. He was like there to, you know, his uh, caretaker. So if Mephibosheth was going to go with David, he would need his servant to pack him up, put him on the thing, and, and take him to see David and go out with him. That's who he was loyal to. David had given Mephibosheth life. He'd given him a place at his table. He'd given him everything. And yet on the way out, not only can Mephibosheth not find his helper, Ziba, Ziba is actually throwing Mephibosheth under the bus. He meets David on the way out, brings him uh, these hundreds of donkeys and, and lots of bread and wine and brings them all to David and says, here, this is for you on your way out to, to keep the men encouraged and energized. And David's first question is, where's Mephibosheth? And, and Ziba lies about it. He says, oh, yeah, Mephibosheth, he wanted to stay back because he wants all the land, which is a total lie. He's, he's, he's absolutely helpless back of the palace. He can't go anywhere. He has nothing to offer or, or give. Well, when Mephibosheth finally, uh, when David's coming back and Mephibosheth hears that David's at the Jordan, he, he, he gets the way to be able to come down to the Jordan. So when he meets David down at the Jordan River, David's got questions. Why don't you come? Like I gave you all of this stuff. Why didn't you come out and meet me? So let's read about the, the scene, in, starting in verse 24. 2 Timothy 19, 24. And Mephibosheth, the son of Saul, came down to meet the king. He had neither taken care of his feet, nor trimmed his beard, nor washed his clothes from the day the king departed until the day he came back to safety. And when he came to Jerusalem to meet the king, he said, he said to him, Why did you not go with me, Mephibosheth? He answered, My lord, O king, my servant deceived me. For your servant said to him, I will saddle a donkey for myself that I may ride it on it and go to, with the king. But your, your servant's lame. 
He has actually slandered your servant to my lord the king. But my lord the king is like the angel of God. Do therefore what seems good to you. For all my father's house were but men doomed to death before my lord the king. But you set your servant among those who eat at your table. What further right have I then to cry to the king? And the king said to him, Why speak any more of your affairs? I have decided you and Ziba shall divide the land. And Mephibosheth said to the king, Oh, let him take it all, since my lord the king has come safely home. You see, David, he loved Mephibosheth. He had given him a place at his table. His dad was Jonathan, who was David's best friend, the guy who encouraged him and, and supported him all through the darkest of nights. And, and when he died, he promised to take care of his son. And so he gave him everything. And then when Mephibosheth doesn't come, it must have broken David's heart. Where's Mephibosheth? So when he sees him, he just goes, why didn't you come? And it's kind of funny, but Mephibosheth's like, yeah, I'm, I'm lame. I couldn't come, but all the power that I had uh, in me was I could take care of myself, and I decided not to do that to show my loyalty to an exiled king. He's living in the house of a rebellious king, Absalom, and, he, and he, his external experience, it all says, I'm not loyal to you at all, Absalom. I'm loyal to David. So here's this lame guy who is totally helpless, living in uh, an the king's home and saying, I'm not loyal to you at all. I, I want nothing to do with you. I'm longing and grieving for the day when David can come back. He takes this huge risk in doing this. His outward appearance says, I'm loyal to David. And David's response to that is really grace upon grace. Uh, Mephibosheth said, look, we would have been dead a long time ago if it wasn't for your grace. So whatever you decide is totally fine. And David says, okay, great. Uh, I'm going to divide the kingdom, uh, your dad's kingdom. It'll be between you and Ziba. And part of it's like, what? That doesn't seem right. Ziba's the guy who's like threw him under the bus and wasn't even there. He's not even royalty. Why would you give him half the kingdom? Now, it's not exactly clear in the text. Uh, the commentary that I think is most compelling is that uh, really what David's doing here is what his son will do, uh, Solomon, with that baby. Remember, like cut the baby in half and let's see. And so he's doing something similar to that here. Did you really want the land or did you not? And so he says, I'll give you half the land and your servant half the land. I'm going to split it in half. And, and what's, uh, what's Mephibosheth's response? Just take it all. Then I, I, don't, I don't care about the land. I care that you're back. Uh, but, but however that turns out, you have to admit that David's response to both Mephibosheth and Ziba is grace. Neither one of them deserved it. And in fact, that grace upon grace upon grace made these two enemies now citizens of the same kingdom. Uh, this grace united people that were once far off. Well, Mephibosheth comes down to the river and is shown lots of grace. He's totally... Uh, helpless. A, a guy who once threw this helpless guy under the bus also receives grace. It's just grace upon grace upon grace. But stay with me, because here's the third person. The third person that comes to meet David. Here's the, the third section in our message. The lost and the proud are met with grace. The lost and the proud are met with grace. Enter Barzillia. Barzillai. Barzillai, a uh, funky name, uh, he's an old, wealthy guy living uh, outside of the promised land that when David comes uh, in exile, this Barzillai, Barzillai actually ends up taking care of him and gives him lots of stuff. And he's old and he's wealthy. Uh, so let's read about this encounter. Verse 31. Now Barzillai, the Gileadite, had come down from Rogalim, and he went on with the king to the Jordan to escort him over the Jordan. Barzillai was, very, uh, was a very aged man, 80 years old. Uh, he, was provided, he had provided the king with food while he stayed at Mahanaim, for he was a very wealthy man. And the king said to Barzillai, come over with me, come to my kingdom, and I will provide for you with me in Jerusalem. But Barzillai said to the king, how many years have I still to live that I should go up, from, uh, go up with the king to Jerusalem? 
I am this day 80 years old. Can I discern what is pleasant and what is not? Can your servant taste what he eats or what he drinks? Can I still listen to the voice of singing men and singing women? Why then should your servant be an added burden to my lord, the king? Your servant will go a little way over the Jordan with the king. Why should the king repay me with such a reward? Please let your servant return, that I may die in my own city, near the grave of my father and my mother. But here is your servant, Kimham. Let him go over with my lord, the king, and do for him whatever seems good to you. And the king answered, Kimham shall go over with me, and I will do for him whatever seems good to you. And all, of that, and all that you desire of me, I will do for you. Then all the people went over the Jordan, and the king went over. And the king kissed Barzillai and blessed him, and he returned to his own house. The king went up to Gilgal, and Kimham went on with him. All of the people of Judah and also half the people of Israel brought the king on his way. Uh, Barzillai is this old wealthy guy living uh, outside, very comfortable. He's got everything he needs. And in fact, he's got even more than he needs. So he gives it to other people as well. Uh, he is actually fine with helping the king. He's a very generous man. But at the point that he comes down to the Jordan to meet uh, with King David, David says, come into my kingdom. Come with me. Let me provide for you. And Barzillai um, it doesn't really say, and it's left to wonder, is this supposed to be uh, followed, or are we supposed to look up to this or look down uh, to his response? I'm just going to tell you my personal, my personal feeling. When I read this, I was like, how sad that he gets to this place, just feet away from entering the king's kingdom, and he says, I'm going to go back to what I know. Uh, he, he's fine with giving and being in that place where, oh, yeah, I can help out. But as soon as David, the king, says, let me help you out, he says, nah, I'd rather not. He doesn't want to humble himself. Uh, he doesn't want to come into the kingdom. He wants to go back to his land, his house, his father's. And, and actually, uh, going into the kingdom is more about relationship with the king than it is all these pleasures that he's saying, oh, I've already had all these pleasures. I don't really need them anymore. It, it, to me, it feels really, really sad. He's just, he just steps away from the kingdom. It just steps away. If he would have just gone through the waters of the Jordan and entered the kingdom, but, but he was too proud. And yet, David responds with grace. Grace upon grace. He, he kisses him. He, he says, oh, you have this guy? Yeah, bring him into the kingdom. I'm okay with that. The people that turn and reject the king, he actually uh, responds with grace to them. Uh, go and, and do as you will. Well, we've seen three people, and we have this little part at the end that I want to just do a tag along and as kind of as an application too. So lastly, we're going to see that the broken, confused, arrogant, angry, selfish are all met with grace. Let me, let me say that again. The broken, the confused, the arrogant, the angry, the selfish, they're all met with grace. And that's where you and I enter. You see, there's this crowd joining David as these people start coming. And more and more people hear about it. So they're coming down. Who's going to join in this parade to bring the king back to Jerusalem? And as they start gathering around and coming together, these people start arguing, actually. Who's the best? Who's the greatest in the kingdom? Who, who's closer to the king? Who really deserves this more than other people? They start arguing over it. They, they don't get it that this kingdom is marked by grace. They start arguing, oh, I'm closer, and I'm actually better than this person. L listen to how it goes down in verse 41. Then all the men of Israel came to the king and said to the king, Why have our brothers and the men of Judah stolen you away and brought the king and his household over the Jordan and all of David's men with him? All the men of Judah answered the men of Israel, Because the king is our close relative. Why then are you angry over the matter? Have we eaten? At all, of, uh, at all at the king's expense? I mean, he's still got stuff left over. Why are you mad? Or has he given us any gift? And the men of Israel answered the men of Judah, We have ten shares in the king. And in David, also, we have more than you. Why then did you despise us? Were we not the first to speak of bringing back our king? But the words of the men of Judah were fiercer than the words of the men of Israel. And you can 
feel it like a road trip and the kids in the back seat going back and forth and back. Stop it! Just stop it! And this is the crowd that's escorting the king back to Jerusalem. Who's the greatest? Who, who's closer to David? Who's closer to David the king? Who, who is it? And they failed to realize each and every one of you are here simply by the grace of God. There is no greater citizen or less citizen in it. Now, in the same way, I'm going to bring it all home. In the same way, the kingdom of God, the church, his people, should be marked by grace upon grace upon grace. If you are an enemy of God in your childhood and you come into the church, welcome. We are so glad you're here. If you have absolutely nothing to bring the kingdom and you think you are helpless, you don't know anything. You've never read the Bible and you come into the church. Welcome. We are so glad you're here because the only thing that really unites us is the grace of God through the death and the resurrection of Jesus. So there's no better Christians or worse Christians. There's just saved Christians by grace. Uh, if you've entered and you've followed the king, if you are a believer or a Christian, you should be marked by grace. And if we err in this season of COVID, let it be on the side of grace upon grace upon grace. Now, uh, I'm sure in a room this size with this many people, there are some people that are right at the gate. And you say, well, I've done a lot of good stuff. I've given to the church. I've helped out. I've bought the, the presents for the kids. The king is still like, you're met with grace. But would you come in? Would, would, you, would you walk through the Jordan River? Would you go through the, the waters to come into the kingdom? It's just one more step. You'll be met with grace. So as we end here, I, I want to I tell you, uh, if you look around, you might think, boy, I really, do I deserve to be here? Or that guy, he's really, I mean, the pastor is a really good Christian. And I want to tell you, as you look around here, you do not, there is not one better Christian or worse Christian than you. You look next to you, and I'll tell you what you see. You'll see a sinner that's saved by grace. That's it. A sinner that's saved by grace. That's what we're doing here, right? Uh, let me pray, and then we have something special. Lord, thanks for this message. Thanks for the picture of what it is of the kingdom that you established through your son, Jesus. Lord, and we know there are parameters on that kingdom, and there's a gate to that kingdom, and that's through Jesus. And Lord, there are some people that are outside of that kingdom and some people that are in that kingdom. And Lord, your call, your approach, everything is grace upon grace. If people would just come, the repentant sinner can find grace. The helpless can find grace. The proud can find grace. The, the selfish, the arrogant, the broken, the lost can all find grace if they come to you, the great king. And so, Lord, would we be people that are marked by that grace? That when people think of the church, they think of people that have been radically changed because of your grace to them. Lord, none of us deserve it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.